Hello friends. In this lesson we're going to learn about how to understand word types in context. But what does that mean? In English we've got seven basic word types. We've got nouns, verbs, adjectives, adverbs, prepositions, determiners, and conjunctions. But the question you might ask yourself sometimes, if you're not asking it right now, is which one is which? How do I know the difference between a noun and a verb in a sentence, or between an adjective and an adverb? Especially when you're reading something in higher level or academic English. Well, the big key for understanding the difference between these word types is the context. That is, how is the word being used in a sentence? Now, if you can look at the sentence and gather some information or some clues, about where the word is, what it looks like, and what other words it's connected to, then that will help you to know what kind of a word it is or what type of word it is. Also, if you're trying to write something in English or even speak, and you want to use a word, but you're not quite sure which form of the word to use in the sentence where you want to use it, then you can use these same clues or the same information to figure out which form of the word you should be using in the sentence. So in this video we're going to go through these clues or these pieces of information that you can use to understand word types in context or in sentences. The first word types we're going to look at are what are known as the closed groups or the function words in English. So a closed word type group is a type of word that doesn't have any new words being added to it. That is, if you learn these words, then there are no more new words that can be added to these groups in English. They're closed groups. These are also known as function words because in a sentence, they don't normally carry the main meanings in the sentence. What they do is they show the relationships or the functions of parts of the sentence. The first group here that we're going to look at are determiners. So determiners are a closed group of words. That is, if you learn these words, then there are no new words, no new determiners to learn. So a determiner is a word that identifies a noun, or it can introduce a noun in a sentence. Basically, a determiner tells you which one you're talking about for a noun in a sentence. We've got basically five kinds of determiners. We've got articles, demonstratives, possessives, quantifiers, and numbers. So the articles are a, an, and the. And some books or websites will also include the word some. Demonstratives are pointing words like this, that, these, and those. Possessives are words about what the noun belongs to or who it belongs to. And the possessive determiners are my, your, his, her, its, our, their, and if you have any noun with the apostrophe s, that's a possessive determiner. Quantifiers, such as few or a few, little or a little, many, much, more, most, some, any, no, and there are more quantifiers than this. That's why we have etc. at the end. So there's more quantifiers than that are on the list here. Or numbers sometimes work as determiners. So like one, two, three, four, five. If you say um, five people, then that five can work as a determiner in the sentence. Out of all of these determiners, the words a, an, and the, my, your, her, its, our, and their, only work as determiners in a sentence. That is, if you see one of these words in yellow, then the only job that it can do in a sentence is to work as a determiner. And that can be very helpful to know, as we'll look at at the end of this video when we look at some real context, some real sentences, um, and some vocabulary within those sentences. You'll see how knowing that these words are determiners will help you to know the word type of other words in a sentence. So in a sentence, a determiner always comes before a noun. Its only job is to identify a noun in a sentence. So sometimes it, there can be an adjective after the determiner and before the noun, 
or sometimes there can be an adverb plus an adjective between a determiner and the noun that it's identifying. But a determiner is always connected to a noun in a sentence, and the noun always comes after the determiner. So there might be a few words in between the determiner and the noun. But if you see a determiner, you know that there will be a noun in one, two, three, or four words after the determiner. You should look for a noun. The second group here are prepositions. So prepositions are a closed group of words in English. There are no new prepositions coming into the language. So a preposition is a word that shows a relationship in location, time, or direction in English. So it's a function. The function is that it's showing a relationship usually between nouns. So the most common prepositions in English are in, on, at, to, from, with, of, for, by, and after. But with these words we have to be careful because these prepositions can also be used um, for other things in the sentence. For example, the word to can have a few different jobs in the sentence. It's not only a preposition. If it's a preposition, it will usually come before a noun or a noun phrase. So if you see a preposition, there should be a noun or a noun phrase after it. Prepositions also often come after a noun or a verb. Again, prepositions usually connect or show a relationship between nouns. So it'll come after a noun and it'll usually have a noun after it as well. Sometimes prepositions will come after a verb. So in the sentence, if you have a phrasal verb, that is a verb that has more than one, uh, more than one word, then sometimes the second word will be a preposition. And prepositions sometimes come at the beginning of a sentence because a lot of the time we use prepositional phrases to talk about where or when something happens. And when we do that, you'll often have a prepositional phrase at the beginning of a sentence. The third group of uh, closed words we're going to talk about here are conjunctions. So conjunctions are words that connect words, phrases, or clauses. So they're very similar to prepositions, but they can do more than prepositions can do. Prepositions usually connect just nouns or noun phrases together. A conjunction can connect a word, phrase, or a clause together. So the most common conjunctions, or some of the most common ones, are and, but, or, and so. Also because, while, when, if, whether, or since. Of these words, and, but, and, or can only work as conjunctions in a sentence. So this is helpful because, again, if you see the word and, but, and, or, the only job it can do in a sentence is to work as a conjunction. Some of these other words, they can do other jobs in the sentence, like some of the conjunctions and prepositions are the same. Like the word after, the word after could work as a preposition or a conjunction. It just depends on how it's being used in the sentence. But and, but, and or, they can only be conjunctions. Conjunctions can come at the beginning of a sentence or somewhere in the middle of a sentence. But because conjunctions are connecting words, then they don't normally come at the very end of a sentence. You won't usually, I don't think I can think of any examples where I use a conjunction at the end of a sentence because conjun conjunctions will connect two things together. So there has to be something after the conjunction. So now we're going to look at the open groups or the open word types in English. And these are also called content words. So these open groups, they're open because we can add new words into these groups. There's new words coming into these groups all the time in English. So these are the groups that have thousands and thousands and thousands of words. Whereas with determiners, there's probably only a, a dozen or a couple dozen determiners. Um, or with prepositions, there's maybe 150 prepositions if you include one word, two word, and three word prepositions. But for these open groups, there's thousands and thousands and thousands of words. So we just have to look at how they're being used in the sentence. They're called content words because they carry the main information in a sentence. So the first group of content words are nouns. A noun is a word for a person, place, thing, or an idea. And so here we have 10 of the most common nouns in English. 
Some common noun suffixes are the ER or OR ending, like teacher or doctor or computer, the ION, TION, ATION, and ITION ending, the ITY or TY ending, the MENT ending, ending like government, the NES ending like kindness or sadness, the ANTS or ENTS ending, um, the ISM ending like uh, realism or racism, and the IST ending, which is related, which is the like realist or racist. And then the S or ES ending, which is for a noun, the plural ending. If we're making something plural, then we would add S or ES to it. It's very useful to know the most common suffixes for each of the word types. Um, it, a suffix will usually change the type of a word. So if we have a verb, we can often change it into a noun by adding a suffix to it. And if you know the most common suffixes, then these are a really easy way to know what kind of a word it is in a sentence if you see the suffix on there. So nouns in a sentence can come before a verb and they'll work as the subject. They can come after a verb working as the object or they can come after a preposition. So they would be the object of a preposition then. So these are the main places that you'll find a noun in a sentence, either before a verb, after a verb, or after a preposition. Nouns can also come after a determiner, as we talked about before. Determiners and nouns go together. However, a noun doesn't have to have a determiner, so you don't always see a determiner in the sentence. And proper nouns are capitalized. So if you see a word in a sentence and it's not the first word and it's capitalized, then it's a proper noun. So that's an easy way to identify a noun. Verbs are words for an action or a state. So here are some of the most common verbs in English. The most common verb in English is the be verb. But when we talk about the be verb, we're talking about all of its different forms, like am, is, are, was, were, been, or being. But also the word have, to, uh, have, do, say, get, make, go, know, take, see. These are the most common verbs in English. Some of the most common verb suffixes are the eight, I's, or N ending, the phi or fi, the ing ending, the D or ed ending, and the S or es ending. Now these last three endings here, they are called inflections. So they're not working just like suffixes. They're inflections because they tell us about the verb tense or um, about who the subject is in the sentence. So the ing ending we use with the progressive or continuous forms. The d or ed we use with the past tense verb forms. And the s or es ending we use with the third person singular subject. If the subject is third person singular, then that will have an s or an es in the present simple form. So these suffixes are useful to know, again, because if you recognize a suffix like eyes, uh, you'll pretty much only see this with verbs. So if you see that on a word, then you're like, ah, that's a verb. Some of the other ones can be used for other wor verb form or word forms. So the ing or the d or ed ending or the s or es, they actually can be used sometimes by nouns um, or by adjectives like the ing and ed. Sometimes adjectives will have those endings and the s or es, sometimes nouns will have the same thing. But for nouns, it's plural. For a verb, it's the third person singular ending. So we have to be careful with these. They can give us some information, but they don't always get used for only one word type. In a sentence, a verb can come after a subject or before an object. So if you see a word in between two nouns or noun phrases, then a lot of the time that's a verb. A verb can also come after the word to, like to run, to walk, to jump. This is called an infinitive. Or verbs can come after modal or auxiliary verbs. So the modals in English are can, could, shall, should, will, would, may, might, and must. Most of these words can only work as a modal verb. So if you see like the word should, then it, it will have a verb after it because the word should doesn't work by itself in a sentence. It can't be its own verb or must. The auxiliary verbs are 
the verbs am, is, are, was, were, be, been, have, has, had, do, does, did. So they're auxiliary verbs when they are working as a helping verb for a main verb. So if you see like were, then you might see walking. We were walking. So in that case, then were is a auxiliary or helping verb. Adjectives are words that describe or modify a noun. That's their only job in a sentence. So like great, good, new, first, old, uh, colors like red, blue, yellow, gold. And here are some common adjective suffixes like the full or less suffix, the OUS ending, the ER or EST ending, the ish ending like bluish or greenish. And in a sentence, adjectives come in three main places. They can come before the noun they're describing. They can come after an indefinite pronoun, like something, anything, nothing, or everything. Um, or they can come after a linking verb, like am, as, are, was, were, be, become, get, seem. So adjectives can come after these kinds of verbs. But all they're doing is they are describing a noun somehow. Adverbs basically can describe anything else in the sentence. Adjectives only describe nouns. Adverbs can describe lots of other things. So they can describe or modify a verb, an adjective, or another adverb. Sometimes they can modify a whole phrase or even a whole sentence. So adverbs are, for example, really or very, now, always, never, frequency words, slowly, quickly, probably, more, enough, and the, the most common adverb suffix, basically the only one, is ly. So if you see a word with ly, it is most likely an adverb, but it's not always an adverb. Like the word friendly, friendly is an adjective, even though it has an ly on the end. So adverbs can come a lot of different places in a sentence. It depends on what kind of an adverb it is. It can come at the beginning or end of a sentence. It can come before or after a verb. So if an adverb is modifying a verb, it will either come right before or right after the verb. Adverbs can also come before an adjective or an adverb. So if the adverb is modifying or changing or describing an adjective or an adverb, it will come right before it. So you'll have an adverb plus an adjective or an adverb plus an adverb. So an adverb plus an adjective, you might say, um, it's really cold. So really is an adverb. Adjective is cold, really cold. Or really slowly. So really is an adverb and slowly is an adverb. Besides the word types and the suffixes, it's important to know the basic sentence structures in English. If you know the basic sentence structures in English, this will help you to identify word types as well. So quickly, we got three types of sentence in English. We've got commands, we've got statements, and we've got questions. And the difference between these is what kind of words we have in the sentence and what order they go in. So with a command, a command or um, a direction will start with a verb. So we can have a verb or a verb plus an object. We can have other words in the sentence as well, but the sentence will start with a verb. Um, and it might have other things in there after the verb, like an object. This is different than a statement, because a statement will start with a subject and then the verb. Or it'll have a subject verb and then an object. Now, there can be other words here, like adjectives and adverbs and things like that, prepositions. But we don't have to have those things. We just have to have a subject and a verb, or a subject, verb, and object. For questions... The question will start with a helping verb, and then we'll have the subject and then the main verb. So let's look at the difference here between a statement and a question. So a statement might be, I am talking. So subject is I, and the verb is am talking. So there's a helping verb and a main verb. If I want to make that into a question, I would say, am I talking? So am, the helping verb, will come before the subject, I and then the main verb, talking. That's how we make a question in English. We put the helping verb first. 
for a yes or no question. If we want to make it to an information question, it's the same thing. We just add a WH word at the beginning, like who, what, when, where, why, or how. So if you know these three basic sentence structures, commands, statements, and questions, and if you look at the punctuation in the sentence, that will help you to know, you know what's what in the sentence. What's the subject? What's the verb? What's the object? Um, and a subject is usually a noun or a noun phrase. Okay, so let's practice with this a little bit with some real sentences. For this video, I've taken some sentences from this recent news article called Coronavirus May Be a Blood Vessel Disease, which explains everything. All right, the coronavirus is a big deal now. Everybody's talking about it. And there's a lot of science surrounding it, which means if you read any news articles about the virus, you're likely to see academic vocabulary or scientific vocabulary, which can be difficult to understand. So let's practice identifying some word types. So here I've highlighted some of the different words we're gonna look at here. We wanna figure out, are these words nouns, verbs, adjectives, adverbs, prepositions, conjunctions, or determiners? So in the first sentence here, in April, blood clots emerged as one of the many mysterious symptoms attributed to COVID-19, a disease that had initially been thought to largely affect the lungs in the form of pneumonia. This is all one sentence, which makes it extra difficult besides the vocabulary. Okay, we see it's got a period at the end, so it's a statement or a command, but if we look at the beginning here, we don't see a verb. So this is a statement, which means we're gonna have subject, verb, or subject, verb, object. Now we see this in April in a comma, which means this is extra information, so we don't have to think about this. So starting here, we should see subject, verb. So the subject is usually a noun or a noun phrase, and then a verb. If we look here, we see this word emerged has the ed ending and it's coming after this these first two words blood clots so if i look here i can see that emerged is my verb in the sentence because then that means that this is the subject so emerged it's got the ed ending which is a verb ending usually um, and it's coming after the subject, which means that this is a verb. So by looking at the ending and by looking at where it's at, at the sen in the sentence, I can tell that this word emerged is a verb in the sentence. Um, you might be wondering, like, how do I know this is the subject? Like I said, a subject is usually a noun or a noun phrase. So if I look at the first two words here, blood and clot, you probably know what blood is. And blood is a thing, right? Which means that this is going to be a noun. Now here, this word clots, you might not know what that is. But because it's at the beginning of a sentence and it's got the S ending, the S ending can either be for a verb or for a noun as a plural ending. But we've already got a verb here, which means that this is probably the plural S on a noun. So here we've got a noun, blood clots. And these two are actually working together. Um, blood is just describing what kind of a, a clot that it is. So even if you don't know what the word clot means, we know that this is the subject of the sentence, that it's plural, whatever this is, and that blood is describing it, something to do with blood. And then the verb here is describing something that the blood clots are doing. So blood clots emerged. So even if you don't know what the words clots and emerged mean, we at least know that clots is a noun and emerged is a verb and that blood is describing clots or clots. So moving on here, symptoms and attributed. Let's look up these words here. Let's try and figure out what they are. So symptoms is, we see the S ending, which means it's either going to be a noun or a verb. If we look at the next word, attributed, we see the ED ending again. So we're seeing the same pattern here. We have the ED ending after a word with the S ending, which means again that this is probably a verb and this is probably going to be a noun. Another clue that tells me that this is a noun is if I look before it, I see this word mysterious. And then if I look a couple words before, I see the many. Remember, the word the is always a determiner. And determiners have to go with nouns. So I see the many. Many here is not working as a verb. It's actually in as a noun, it's working as an adjective. So many, many is a counting word. 
and so I'm counting nouns. So the many mysterious, I see this O-U-S ending. The O-U-S ending is an adjective ending. So if I look here, the word the, I know I have to have a noun, but this, this word here is an adjective and this word's an adjective. Then I've got this word and then I've got a verb. Well, I have to have a noun here be, before the verb, which means that symptoms is the only place that I can have a noun. So symptoms, it's got the S ending, which is a plural ending, and it's coming after an adjective and it's coming after a determiner, so I know that this is a noun. And then again, attributed, it's got the ED ending, it's coming after a noun, so I know that this is gonna be a verb. Now let's move on to this word initially. This should be an easy one. It's got the LY ending, which means 90% of the time it's gonna be an adverb. Uh, but let's double check. Let's, let's see where it's, where it's at in the sentence. A disease that had initially been thought to play. If I look here, I've got the word had and been and thought. These are all verbs, and they're actually all working together. So had here is working as a helping verb, and been is working as a helping verb, and thought is my main verb. If you've got more than one verb in a row like this, the last verb is always the main verb. Which that's, that's why I know these are helping verbs, because if I have one, two, three verbs like this, the last one is going to be the main verb. So the ones before that are going to be helping verbs. So I've got a helping verb, a helping verb, and a main verb. And this word initially is in the middle here. The only thing that can go in the middle between a helping verb or a helping verb and a main verb is an adverb. That's the only thing that can go between a helping verb and a main verb is an adverb. So it's got the ly ending, and it's between a helping verb and a main verb, so I know that this is an adverb. All right, so a disease that had initially been thought to largely affect the lungs. So here I've got this word affect. Now, what kind of a word is this? Well, let's look at where it is. We've got the word to here, and we've got an ly word, largely. So again, it's ly, so it's most likely going to be an adverb. And then after it, I've got this word, and then I've got the lungs. So the is a determiner, which goes with a noun. And I see here, this is a preposition, so this has to be my noun. So I've got a word that's before a noun, which is the lungs, it's before a noun phrase. And it's after an adverb, and it's after the word to. So this is gonna be a verb. So it's like to, if, to effect. Right? Remember, a verb can come after the word to, and adverbs often describe verbs. So because I have the word to here, I've got an adverb, and it's before a noun. So this is probably the object. Uh, I've got a verb here. And then let's look at this last one. In the form of pneumonia. Now, this is a nice word, pneumonia. But what kind of a word is it? If I look here... I've got the word of, and of is a preposition. And as I said earlier in the video, after a preposition, we'll usually have a noun or a noun phrase. So I've got a preposition here, which means that this has to be a noun. A noun phrase would be more than one word with, with a noun. But this, there's only one word here, so this is a noun, because we'll have preposition plus a noun. So even if I don't know what pneumonia means, I know that it's a noun. Next sentence here. Quickly after came reports of young people dying due to coronavirus-related strokes. So let's figure out this word reports. It's got the S ending, so it's either a verb or a noun. Um, now let's look at the rest of the sentence. It's got a period, so it's either a command or a statement. But if I look here, I don't see a verb at the beginning. I see quickly after, but I do see a verb here, came. And came is a very common one, so I know that's a verb, which means that this is my subject. So I got my subject and verb. And now I've got this word reports. So I've got the S here, but I've already got a verb, which means that this is going to be a noun. Also, it's coming after a verb, which means that this is the object of the noun. So quickly after came reports, and then... I've got a preposition here. 
So a lot of the times prepositions will come after nouns because they're describing. So of young people dying due to coronavirus related strokes, this is all describing the reports. So this is coming after a verb. It's got the S ending, so it's plural. So this is a noun. Now let's look at this one here. Coronavirus related strokes. So related, what kind of a word is this? Well, it's got the ED ending, so it could be a verb or it could be an adjective. But if I look here, it's got this hyphen. It's hyphenated, that's weird. So let's leave this word here for a second and look at the next word, strokes. It's got the ES ending. But where is it in the sentence? Let's look before it. We see due to. So we've got a preposition here. And what comes after a preposition normally? A noun or a noun phrase, right? Um, so here I've got to have a noun or a noun phrase. So I've got this S here, which means that this, because it's coming after a preposition, it's got the S ending. This is most likely going to be a noun. So if this is a noun, what comes before nouns? Well, in a sentence, determiners and adjectives come before nouns. This isn't definitely, it isn't a determiner. So then that means that this is working as an adjective. Now the hyphen here, it's connecting these two words, so it's making these two words work like one word. Um, and in a sentence, normally you'll only see either nouns or adjectives hyphenated. So we've got the ed ending, and it's hyphenated, and it's coming before a noun that makes this an adjective. Next sentence here. Next, it was COVID toes, painful red or purple digits. Now, I want you to look at this whoops, uh, this uh, punctuation here quickly. It looks a lot like this one here, but this one is a shorter line, and this one is a longer line. So this one's actually called a dash, and it's different than a hyphen. So this one's not connecting two words together. So it's not connecting toes and painful together. It's working differently in the sentence. Usually a dash will come when we're adding extra information or more specific information about what we just talked about. So next it was COVID toes. So what this is doing here is this is giving us more information about what they're talking about right here. So COVID toes. Now what is that? Painful red or purple digits. So if you know what a toe is, the thing on your foot, right? You've got 10 of them on your foot. Toes is just the plural form. So you've got 10 toes. So this, because this is giving us more information about the toes, let's look at what this says. Painful, red, or purple digits. Now, as I mentioned before in the video, colors are adjectives, usually. So red, purple, these are both adjectives. What do adjectives do? Adjectives describe nouns. And if we look here, this is the only word that's left. And red is describing this word and purple is describing this word. Which means that this is a noun. Also, we see the S ending. So we've got the S ending. We've got adjectives before it. So this is a noun. And also it's connected to the word toes, which is also a noun with the S ending on it. So we've got a lot of information here that tells us that this word digits is a noun. Also, the way it looks in the sentence, it's being used as a synonym for toes. Next sentence, what do all of these symptoms have in common? So we see the S ending here. Um, we also have an OM suffix on there, or T-O-M, and so this means that it's either a noun or a verb because of the S ending here. But let's look at where it is in the sentence then. So what do all of these symptoms have in common? So do is a verb. That's a very, very common verb. All of these symptoms have. Have is also a verb. And this is a question. And if you remember the org organization of a question, we'll have a helping verb a subject, and then a main verb. Since I know have is a verb and do is a verb, that means that this in between is the subject. And we've got our WH word here. So we've got a basic sentence structure. We have a WH word, helping verb, subject, main verb. 
So this word symptoms is in the subject. Remember, a subject, subject is usually a noun or a noun phrase. So this is a noun phrase. And in a noun phrase, see we've got the plural s there, which means that this is going to be the noun. That's the noun right there. So symptoms. We've got the plural s. It's in the subject place. So we know this is a noun. And then it's got this suffix there, but it's not a very common suffix, so it doesn't help us a lot. And this sentence, an impairment in blood circulation. So here's where suffixes can really help you. So if you see the ment suffix and the a-t-i-o-n suffix, those are very common noun suffixes. Also, we've got the word an, which only works as a determiner. So we've got a determiner plus its noun. In blood circulation, in is a preposition. And after prepositions, we have nouns. So there's the noun. So based on where it's at in the sentence and what kind of a suffix it has, I know that both of these are nouns. Actually, this one's kind of tricky because you see there's a period, but there's no verb here, which means that this is not a complete sentence. And then the last one here. Add in the fact that 40% of deaths from COVID-19 are related to cardiovascular complications, and the disease starts to look like a vascular infection instead of a purely respiratory one. So we're going to look at these green words here. So related to vascular complications. Here I see the A-T-I-O-N ending and the S. So A-T-I-O-N goes with nouns, and the S can go with nouns too. So this is a noun there. The disease starts to look like a vascular infection. So I see again the T-I-O-N ending, which is a noun ending. I see the L-Y ending here, which usually goes with adverbs. So I'm going to guess that this is an adverb right now. And then I've got the other suffixes aren't so common, so I'll have to wait on those. Let's look at the order of the words in the sentence. Add in the fact that 40% of deaths from COVID-19 are related to. So we've got this word to which can either go with a verb or with a noun. Um, if I look here, cardiovascular, I've got this LAR ending, which is an adjective ending. I see a noun here and what comes before nouns, and usually adjectives. Also, I see the word to here, which is probably a preposition. So I've got a preposition, what comes after prepositions, nouns or noun phrases. And I see a noun here, which means this is a noun phrase. And I've got this LAR ending, which means that this is going to be an adjective because this adjective is describing the complications, which is a noun. And I knew this was a noun because of the suffix and the, the S ending here. So are related to cardiovascular complications and the disease starts to look like a. So and the. So we see the word the, which is a determiner. It's always a determiner. And what comes after determiners? Nouns come after determiners. So the disease starts to look. So start is a verb. Since this is a verb, the only place I can have a noun is right here, which means that this has to be a noun. So the disease. So disease is a noun. Starts to look like a vascular infection. Well, up here we said cardiovascular is an adjective, and we see that it's basically the same, vascular, vascular. Also, we see a noun here, which means that it's the same pattern, adjective, noun, adjective, noun. So this is going to be an adjective. Also, we see the determiner, A, here. And we have the noun here. And what can come in between a determiner and a noun? Basically, just an adjective. Now let's look at these last ones. So it starts to look like a vascular infection instead of A. So there's another determiner. So we know we have to have a noun. Nouns don't usually end in ly, but we have this word here. Respiratory, and then we have the word one. So one is the last word here. Purely, so purely is describing respiratory, and respiratory is describing this word one. And we've got a here, determiner, which means that one of these three words has to be a noun. Now when you have a group of words that are working together after a determiner, the noun will come usually last, which means that the one, word one here is working as a noun actually. So this determiner is going with that noun there. 
Now this word respiratory is describing one. So what describes a noun? An adjective describes a noun. And actually if we look up this A-T-O-R-Y suffix, that's an adjective or a noun suffix. But here we already have the noun, so this is an adjective. Also we have this L-Y before an adjective. Now if we've got an L-Y word before an adjective, it's going to be an adverb, because an adverb can describe an adjective. Also, the only time you'll have an adverb between a determiner and a noun is if that adverb is describing an adjective. So we can see here we've got a determiner, this adverb is describing this adjective, and then we have the noun. And this adjective is describing that noun. So, all of this probably doesn't make 100% sense, but if you start to look at the information or the clues in a sentence, where the word is, what kind of suffix it has, what words come before and after it, then you can start to guess at what type of a word you're looking at, whether it's a noun, verb, adjective, adverb, or any of the others. And that's it for this presentation. Thanks for watching. Good luck with your English.